Hello and welcome to News Click, to our weekly COVID show. We are joined by Dr. Satyajit Ra. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Satyajit. Uh, so today we want to start with the recently released efficacy data of our Indian vaccine, Covaxin, something which we have been waiting for for a long time. The uh, makers of the vaccine have said that this that uh, the interim efficacy of this vaccination is uh, 80.6%. Now, Covaxin has been, you know, we have been administ administering it since January. It, uh, Brazil might also be soon uh, buying up 20 million doses of this, and it's also set to go in a few other countries. But um, so what does this term mean, interim efficacy? Can you tell us about this? Can you tell us about how this effectiveness has been measured? Yeah. So um, let's keep in mind something that uh, we've discussed earlier, which is that all vaccines in human trials go through three phases. So phase one and phase two are safety and immunogenicity trials, meaning that they are trials that together establish that the vaccines are safe with no awful um, consequences and that they generate immune responses in everybody who gets them, uh, generate sort of antibody responses that look as though they would be protective. The phase three clinical trial, on the other hand, is actually a trial to see whether they really do protect. So typically for all COVID-19 vaccines over the past year, ever since last May or, or so when the Moderna trials started, what's been done very broadly is 10,000 people unvaccinated, 10,000 people given this vaccine candidate. And then after the vaccine administration is over, in both groups, you start counting the number of symptomatic COVID-19 cases that occur. And once you have a reasonable number of cases in the unvaccinated group, you ask how many did you get in the vaccinated group? And the difference between those two numbers is the degree of protection mm -hmm. that gets reported. So we have seen these numbers, 92%, 95%, 92.5%, 81%, 62%, 70, you know, whatever, or 80, 81% in Covaxin's case. All of these numbers are simply the calculation of the number of cases in the vac unvaccinated group versus the smaller number of cases in the vaccinated group. And that reduction is the percent efficacy that's being uh, talked about as a number. So there are um, two major limitations with these data. So let's first remind ourselves what these data do tell us. They do tell us that these vaccines show reasonable protection. However, what they don't tell us is two things. Number one, they don't tell us what these numbers are going to look like at the end of the clinical trial, because these are interim data. These are preliminary data. Clinical trials for these vaccines typically are uh, designed to last for a year. So none of the vaccines have had their clinical trial, phase three clinical trials completed, which is why none of the approvals anywhere in the world for any vaccine is a regular regulatory approval. It is all emergency use authorization based on these early data. These early data, therefore, are not necessarily telling us what the percentage protection will be at the end of the clinical trial, number one. Number two, because these early data are typically within the first two, three, four months of the trial, they don't tell us with any great reliability, how long a protection is likely to last. Hmm. So both of these um, missing pieces, we will get when the trials begin to be completed after running for about a year or so. So in the meanwhile, these are really interim efficacy data based on which emergency use authorizations are done. For Covaxin, no such data were available for the past month and a half. Um, and yet the Indian regulatory authorities 
accorded approval and therefore the covaxin approval for deployment was not just a simple emergency use authorization such as was was given for covishield instead it was an approval in clinical trial mode hmm. now as we've discussed did i think that covaxin was not going to work no i thought in common with everybody else that it would work um uh, Part of the reason for that is that a very similar design uh, of a Chinese-made vaccine, inactivated whole virus vaccine, had already been shown to work. So there's no reason to think that it would work. It was shown to be safe. It was shown to be immunogenic. However, regulatory approval without even preliminary efficacy data meant in clinical trial mode, which meant, as we've discussed, that everybody who is getting, who's been getting the vaccine so far, is to sign a uh, consent form. Um, one hopes and presumes that the prime minister has signed the con consent form. Um, but what that meant was that everybody who's getting it is volunteering to be participating in the clinical trial. Right. And that volunteer status is ethical only if there is the option to refuse. It has to be voluntary. But if people are told that if you don't sign the uh, vax, the consent form, you won't get any vaccine, mm. that has begun to, to verge on the coercive. Now that these data have apparently been, been uh, obtained, this is simply a press release that we're dealing with at the moment, presumably the regulatory authorities will see the data, will examine the data and will convert the clinical trial mode approval into a regular emergency use authorization. Mm. Let's keep in mind that these data, in these data, what has been reported, the numbers are, are at the lower end of the general spectrum. There's 36 cases yeah. Yeah. In, the, in the unvaccinated group, I think. That's pretty low. Although there are a couple of other vaccines also for whom, uh, for which, the numbers are similarly low. So this is the background. The hope is that we will now shift to emergency use authorization. We will stop trying to get people to sign consent forms and we can move on from the premature regressive vaccine nationalism into a substantive addressing of the kind of work that we have to do to bring the pandemic. So can you also now give us like a general update on the situation of vaccines right now? We have, um, you know, what, what new ones have been approved? What ones are we expecting to see in the future? What is their efficacy like? So can you tell us, can you tell us about that? So um, steadily vaccines are coming up for approval. So a Janssen, John, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and I tend to insist on this a little pedantically because the vaccine was actually developed by a small company called Janssen. Johnson & Johnson are the uh, multinational funder company. Okay. Um, so the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is an adenovirus-based vaccine like Covishield, except that it was designed as a single-dose vaccine. Mm -hmm which has enormous logistical advantage, um, has just been approved in the United States. Um, there are, one gathers that there are um, bridging trials, meaning phase one and phase two trials going on in India. And if that's correct, then uh, we, sh we can look forward to uh, having that approved. Novavax, uh, which is not based on any of these RNA, DNA, or virus vector, but is straightforward spike protein of the virus with adjuvant injected and you make antibodies in the old fashioned way, um, has shown efficacy and is under consideration and is likely to be approved. And again, there are bridging trials uh, that have been reported to be on in India. So that's yet another vaccine that will be uh, coming up in the, in in the short term, in the near future. Um, my guess is that over the next two months, we are going to start seeing more and more and more vaccines coming up. 
And that's going to change the logistic landscape of vaccination campaigns for COVID-19 quite dramatically. Um, as, as we saw, as soon as the uh, Janssen J&J &J vaccine was approved by the US FDA, the US federal government has made arrangements such that the US president announced originally that the US would have enough vaccines to cover its entire population by the end of July. With the new approval, he's brought that date forward to the end of May. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to happen. It is going to complicate matters as well, because it's a matter of who gets which vaccine, what is the schedule of vaccine delivery, where can it be delivered, which vaccine is to be delivered where. This is going to be an absolute nightmare to organize. And I hope that our health administrative uh, system and framework is going to be up to the task. What has happened over the past two, three days in implementing the larger uh, expanded vaccination campaign for the above 60s and the above 45s with comorbidities hmm. makes one worry, but let us hope that it will work. And when we talk about the efficacy of these vaccines, uh, so Johnson & Johnson is reported to be around 72% effective overall in the initial trials that have been carried out. But um, it's also, and, and, and then when we compare it to Moderna and Pfizer, it was reported uh, approximately 95% effective. But then um, it's also being pointed out now that there's also a difference here because Moderna and Pfizer trials were conducted over the summer when these new variants were contagious, contagious variants were not present and Johnson & Johnson has been tested out now. So how does that compute in all of this? Right. So in the first place, none of these numbers, as I will never tire of pointing out, are reliable numbers. They are based on preliminary data. They are really not real numbers in the precise sense. All that they say is that the vaccine shows reasonable efficacy, good enough to administer to people. This is the first point. The second point is, while it is true that the Moderna and Pfizer uh, trials took place six, seven months ago, uh, and therefore are based on data from a time when the virus population was more homogenous, um, and now clearly the virus population is getting more and more heterogeneous uh, as, as the epidemic progresses. Nonetheless, the evidence that the antibody profiles generated by different vaccines is substantially different, particularly with regard to protection against uh, uh, variants, variants of concern as they, as they are called, that evidence is really very thin. Mm -hmm. So at this point, all we can say is that all vaccines will work with reasonable, uh, will provide reasonable protection against the collection of original strains or the collection of original variants and that even against some of the emerging variants they seem to show respectable protection against p117 for example pretty much all of them seem to show respectable protection hmm. whether the reduction in the degree of protection that they show against a substantially altered variant such as the P1 variant that has been reported from South America. Um, I'm reluctant to use the term resilient. Um, mm -hmm. Against the P1 variant for, that has been reported uh, originally uh, from South America, um, whether that reduction in protective ability of the antibodies is sufficient to have public health consequences in terms of allowing infection to spread in the community and or in allowing people who have been infected earlier with an original strain to be reinfected or not is still quite unclear. Right. The epidemiological data that are being talked about in this respect from the city of Manaus in Amazonia in Brazil seem to indicate that despite having had a large proportion of the, of the city's population antibody positive, hmm. 
by October or so, Manaus is seeing a new surge in cases. Is there reason to be concerned? Yes, there is. Is there reason to panic? No, not simply because there, there is uh, never any good coming out of panic, but also because the Manaus data, which is really at the center of this concern, that evidence is very indirect. It says that by October, 60, 70% of the population of Manaus uh, in Brazil appeared to have antibodies against the original SARS-CoV-2 virus. And yet over the past month or two, case numbers have risen and many of those cases are against, are, are uh, with the P1 variant of the strain. And then interpretation that has been offered is that reinfection with the P1 variant is possible even in people who, are, who have experienced previous SARS-CoV-2 infection and uh, would be expected to be immune to it. All of this is still early days of evidence. And my guess is that what we are nonetheless going to see is that very serious uh, illnesses as a consequence of infection are still going to be reduced as a con uh, by either natural infection with the original strains and or vaccination with the present first generation vaccines. Thank you, Dr. Satyajit, for joining us today in this discussion. We'll come back to you next week and continue our updates. That's all the time we have today. Keep watching this clip. Thank <laughs> you.